Um, so uh, on the on the escalation issue, um, clearly uh, these have uh, these are the most consequential uh, dimensions. There's a lot of debate in Washington about the likelihood, and I hear there's some debate here about the likelihood too. Um, and uh, I think we, uh, you know, uh, as a general matter, can stipulate that it's probably unlikely, um, but they're plausible, and also that um, uh, that the uh, risks of uh, of either of these forms of escalation are higher so long as the war is going on. So rather than saying, you know, they're uh, positing a specific um, uh, percentage-wise or something like that, I think it's it's fair to say, and even if you think it's unlikely, that it's more likely now either form of escalation than it was before February 2022. Um, so, and then we looked at the other uh, three factors through the lens, again, of benefits and potential costs and risks uh, from a U.S. perspective of each of these issues. And we had to sort of vary them based on and assess that variation rather than, you know, an aspect of the war in the abstract. So when looking at the question of territorial control, we examined it through the lens of um, what are the potential benefits of, uh, of greater Ukrainian territorial control for the United States? Since at the time, this is before the counteroffensive, uh, the, the talk was all about um, potential Ukrainian territorial gains. They had just, of course, had these two successful counteroffensive in Kharkiv and Kherson. Um, and so we, uh, we tried to think through this from a sort of objective perspective. And obviously, there's a humanitarian uh, 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 benefit for the U.S. in this context, that there would be fewer Ukrainians uh, living under Russian occupation. Um, and then there are uh, economic benefits for Ukraine, um, uh, which in the long run are uh, important because Ukraine's economic viability makes it less dependent on external assistance. Um, and there's the argument about the norm of territorial integrity. If it's less violated, in theory, there's um, uh, uh, you know, some sort of reinforcement mechanism of that norm. But, you know, as we note, uh, barring for full territorial reconquest, Russia will still be violating Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, it will just be less violating it. And, but in a way, it's sort of like the half pregnant argument. Um, either you're violating a country's sovereignty and territorial integrity or not. Um, and uh, we put, therefore, it sort of as a less significant benefit. Um, now, uh, there are costs associated with it, uh, we argue in the paper. Essentially, that um, they're given that uh, uh, linked to duration. In other words, we had a difficult time disambiguating these aspects because they're interlinked. Uh, and um, essentially, if uh, to enable greater Ukrainian territorial control, the war would have to be prolonged. Um, and as we, I'll get into, we argue that a long war does pose uh, significant uh, challenges for U.S. interests. And um, given that the, uh, that the risk of either form of escalation is higher so long as the war is ongoing, um, the, uh, and particularly if Ukraine successfully retakes a lot of territory, um, in fact, the closest, according to the New York Times, that we came to Russian nuclear use in Ukraine was in about a year ago when uh, the, uh, there were you know, up to 40,000 Russian airborne troops that were potentially caught on one side of the Dnipro River in Kherson region. And uh, uh, it was unclear whether they were gonna be able to successfully retreat. Um, that is when, according to the New York Times, uh, chatter among Russian generals about using nuclear weapons to stop the Russian advance got pretty advanced, so to speak. Um, and so on that, you know, that piece of evidence suggests that significant territorial advantages, uh, advances might, uh, in fact, prompt that kind of consideration on the Russian side. Um, then we tried to assess duration. And of course, there is an argument about the benefits of a long war for, for the US. Um, there's the sort of bleeding Russia um, uh, uh, argument, um, which we put in this category as moderately significant um, because we argue in the paper that Russia's um, essentially been significantly weakened already and that the benefits of prolonging the war are relatively marginal compared to that, uh, all the weakening that's occurred uh, to date. Um, that was true, I think, when this was published in January. It's true now. Um, 
uh, on the less significant, uh, among the less significant benefits, as we note, greater territorial control is possible in the context of a longer war. Um, Russia's ability to menace others is limited while the war is ongoing, uh, and uh, U.S. allies may continue or deepen the current trends that have been, um, you know, beneficial from a U.S. perspective. That is increasing their own defense spending. Um, but you know, we put these in the less significant category for the reasons outlined there. Um, essentially, uh, a lot of them are uh, the trends. For example, are already well established. Um, uh, and um, the extent to which Russia is going to be immediately in a position to menace others might not be uh, as significant given the losses it's already incurred. Um, but we do identify a lot of costs associated with the long war from a U.S. perspective. Um, at the highly significant level, the, uh, the, the prolonged elevated risk of either both forms of escalation um, the, uh, the implications for Ukraine's need for ongoing economic and military support. Um, of course, a longer war means uh, more uh, civilian casualties um, and uh, civilian hardship within Ukraine. Uh, the global economic consequences, um, both in terms of the commodities that are affected by the price of commodities that are affected by the conflict and um, overall global economic growth. Um, the impact on the sort of bandwidth of U.S. foreign policy to focus on anything else, um, which uh, particularly at the height of the crisis was quite limited. Um, and there are other consequences of this, uh, the state of U.S.-Russia relations, as we've seen with the uh, Russian reaction to the uh, October 7th events, where um, I think their uh, willingness to scrap their uh, the, the relations with Israel that had been uh, so uh, painstakingly um, uh, built up over years was essentially a function of the prioritization of their uh, of the Ukraine war in their foreign policy over everything else. Um, so there are consequences for other U.S. interests in other parts of the world. Um, we put in the less significant category because we see it as less likely the possibility of Russian territorial gains in a long war, and. Um, the, uh, the question of Russian dependency on China increasing over the course of a long war. Um, we argued that, that that's uh, sort of another one of these factors that's already locked in, no matter what happens, no matter how long the war goes on from here and out on the Russia-China um, point. But I would note that we got you know, some pushback on, the, on how we categorize this in terms of its significance. Um, some of those we briefed in DC suggested it should be higher on this list. Um, so getting to the, um, the, the final of these factors, five factors that we looked at in terms of assessing the war's trajectory. So there was uh, the two forms of escalation, uh, uh, duration, territorial control, and the form of war termination. And we did a review of the war termination literature in this context. Um, and you know, one thing that was striking is how the rhetoric about um, the war's ultimate uh, trajectory is you know, uh, differs from the way war termination is conceived in, in the literature. In other words, particularly on the question of territorial reconquest. So there was a lot of talk, particularly at the time we were writing, that the war will end when, you know, U Ukraine retakes control over all of its sovereign territory. And, you know, we were reminded in reading the war termination literature that that's not really like, you know, pushing one army across one line on the map is not um, a form of war termination in itself. Uh, and that, you know, there's nothing that says that if the Russian military were pushed across the border that they would stop fighting. Um, in itself, territorial reconquest is not a form of war termination. Um, and, you know, we're also reminded that absolute victory, as conceived of in the war termination literature, is, you know, a quite extreme form of an outcome. Um, in writer's uh, formulation, it's about not having to rely on an agreement with the other side to, uh, to ensure peace. So you can achieve that through occupation, demilitarization, regime change, uh, annihilating the other side. Um, but that is, you know, those are quite extreme outcomes. Arguably, Russia was trying to achieve that in the first weeks of the war um, when it seemed like they were uh, mounting a regime change operation. Um, but as of, you know, the, even the late spring, early summer of uh, 2022, uh, it, it became clear that n neither side was in position to achieve that kind of absolute victory. 
So that leaves us with negotiated outcomes. I mean, that's really the only alternative if an absolute victory is, is not possible. Um, and you know, we differentiate in the paper between uh, forms of negotiated ends to interstate wars. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, thinking about um, armistices or ceasefires as those that only deal with the military aspects of uh, an end to the fighting to a you know, uh, highly um, uh, political documents like peace treaties that normalize relations between belligerents. And there's obviously a spectrum along the, that of uh, different kinds of agreements. Um, but we, we, for analytical purposes, it's useful to distinguish between political settlements and sort of ceasefires that don't deal with um, uh, many or most, or don't normalize relations between the parties. Um, and we, from a US perspective, we make the case in the paper that actually, you know, while a political settlement might be beneficial because there's some evidence from the literature that political settlements are more long lasting, all things considered, than uh, ceasefires, um, you know, it's not, uh, there's no negative uh, consequences from a uh, ceasefire per se. Um, so that really either form of negotiated outcome is fine. So we put that at the bottom of our racking and stacking of these, war of these dimensions of the future. Um, escalation risks uh, as, as the most uh, significant, um, but then we end up having duration over territorial control and thus uh, avoiding the long war um, in, in this, in our analysis is the highest priority for the US after minimizing escalation risks. Um, and uh, that others uh, are uh, lower on that list. Now, if that is uh, in fact the case, then um, uh, we make the argument that the US uh, should take steps that make an end to the conflict over the medium term more likely, recognizing that it's unlikely in the short term. Uh, and since absolute victory is not how it's gonna end, it's gonna end with negotiations, um, avoiding a long war requires efforts to spur talks. Um, so uh, there are um, a number of impediments to beginning negotiations in this context, uh, to put it mildly, um, but we uh, tried to identify them, particularly ones that could be plausibly influenced by you know, a third party um, based on the war termination literature uh, and uh, think about how the US might be able to address them. So I'm gonna talk about policy instruments here um, in the context of war termination literature and how it might address these particular problems. And then after I get through my slides, I'll talk about some other ideas that I have, as I mentioned. Um, so, uh, you know, we identify, um, and this is of course, uh, you know, grounded in the rationalist uh, understanding of war, um, the problem of optimism being uh, uh, an issue for, um, uh, ending a conflict, in other words, that uh, particularly when both sides uh, view that they they can achieve um, greater gains through the use of force, they're unlikely to cease fighting. Um, and uh, through the the work that, in, including in Ryder's book on um, how wars end, about the the credible commitment problem, um, and thus, you know, the pessimism that parties to conflicts have about engaging in peace because they don't believe that the other side will uphold the agreement and thus, even if there's a rational reason for them to stop, they continue fighting uh, nonetheless. Um, so uh, uh, those are of course not the only impediments in this case, but those are the ones that we thought might be amenable to um, potential US policy. So um, we, we argued at the time, and I think that is still the case, although um, the the reasons are slightly different, um, that this war is not resolving the information problem as the sort of classic fear on um, uh, hypothesis would have it. Um, and that is because, you know, the power of one side is so dependent on an external factor that is um, uncertain. And in particular, in this case, the Western military assistance to Ukraine. Um, and so, uh, at the time we were writing this, and I think this is to a certain extent still true, although there's a lot more Ukrainian uncertainty about the future of Western military assistance, you know, because of our own domestic political squabbles about it, um, uh, and, you know, Europeans' internal squabbles too. Um, 
But nonetheless, uh, particularly at the time, and, and to a certain extent to the present, uh, as a result of what the this narrative that the Ukrainians tell themselves about the um, potential for continued and even increased Western military support, they think their ability to prevail might improve over time. Equally, you know, the Russians, and maybe more so now than before, can tell themselves a story about how the West will waver, um, that this will eventually fade as a priority, and thus they will gain in power over time. So um, it's uh, the classic resolution of the information problem that war is supposed to accomplish is not happening here for an empirically demonstrable reason. Um, and uh, the question is how you would uh, address that. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, we also identify um, pessimism, reasons that sides might be, might be pessimistic about the benefits of peace. Um, you know, Obviously, Kiev has good reason to think that Russia is a predator state that would uh, you know, violate any agreement um, and abandon any ceasefire, treat it as an operational pause. Um, that's, uh, I think, an empirically grounded assessment. Uh, and that's the credible commitment problem uh, in spades, of course. Uh, and um, then uh, the, uh, the question about um, the, the sort of appeal of peace to, to the Russian side um, when they were talking, and I'll get into this in a second, uh, this has obviously changed since then. Um, you know, they, I think, were interested in uh, getting Ukrainian commitment to non-alignment, as we saw in the talks when they were occurring, uh, but wanted external, th they didn't believe essentially a Ukrainian pledge uh, in itself. Um, and uh, uh, because there's a history of, you know, uh, mutual breaking of agreements in that context, um, and of course, there's, this is more, uh, you know, based on the incentive, the sort of relatively successful cases of using sanction relief as an incentive to, uh, get, um, arrangements, uh, that touch on core security interests, such as in the Libyan case or the Iranian case, um, that requires a sort of credible commitment to relieve sanctions if, uh, in fact, uh, certain conditions are met and, um, uh, I think, you know, with good reason, the Russians tell themselves that um, these sanctions are forever uh, and there's nothing they can do to get out from under them. Um, so uh, that, I think, potentially makes peace less appealing for them. So um, what, are, what are the ways in which U.S. policy might be able to address these impediments? Um, on the, uh, and I'll go through each of these, of course, with the caveat that these are not magic wands. Um, and uh, there are um, uh, limits to which all of them could, uh, could address the impediments directly. So in terms of clarifying the future of aid to Ukraine, which is the first one we described. So if your concern is about Russian optimism about the future, and you want to dissuade Russian optimism or diminish it, uh, your um, you would want to pursue then a long-term plan for security assistance to Ukraine um, because that could make Russia more pessimistic about the future. Um, by contrast, if your concern is about Ukrainian over-optimism about the future, which I don't think is less of a concern now than it was when we were writing, but nonetheless, it could change. And these have changed over the course of the war. Um, you could potentially condition future military aid on commitments to negotiations. That, of course, would make Ukraine more pessimistic about its chances. Now, there have been nuanced ways of doing this. I'm not talking about like a cutoff or anything. In the context of the Camp David Accords, of course, um, the security assistance was increased after peace was achieved. There was sort of a side payment for peace that the United States gave to both parties. So you could say, we'll give you X uh, during the war and X plus Y after a ceasefire is concluded if you want to do it. Uh, but of course here, this is not an easy equation to work out. Um, you're making assessments based on other sides' perceptions of their own chances. Uh, and you could create per perverse incentives no matter which way you go. So in increasing one side's, uh, decreasing one side's optimism, you might increase the others too much. Um, and I don't know that there's an easy solution here. We just note that, <laughs> um, put that on policymakers' desks. Um, you could, uh, if the concern was about to, to address the credible commitment problem uh, that Ukraine has with Russia, 
um, uh, security commitments from uh, Western allies could um, uh, potentially address that, uh, mitigating the pessimism about peace. Uh, we discussed the forms in which those security commitments uh, have in the past come, you know, ranging from um, the U.S.-Israel MOU, which is verges on that, to uh, obviously things like Article Five. Um, there's a need here to sort of thread the needle of uh, of commitments that are uh, reassuring without. Um, uh, either limiting future U.S. options or uh, inflaming tensions with Russia, uh, but we identify that as a potential instrument. And here I should note throughout that we don't actually make any recommendations in the report. Um, it's just uh, laying out options about how to address this um, rather than saying this is what, uh, uh, you know, should be done. Um, so uh, if, if Ukraine were to uh, return to uh, what it was considering in the spring and summer of 2022 that is uh, embracing non-alignment. Uh, obviously, it has chosen precisely the opposite in the interim, but we're positing that if, that would be a prerequisite to all of this. Um, you, we could imagine commitments to that, um, which was what uh, actually was on the table in uh, the Istanbul negotiations when they were occurring in March of 2022. Um, that could that could address both the the, the credible commitment problem from uh, Russia's perspective, um, and uh, but of course here you get this problem with uh, the the ways in which it might affect Ukraine's um, perceptions about the, the desirability of peace as well. Um, and finally, uh, you know, you could create incentives or increase uh, decrease Russia's pessimism about the benefits of peace um, by establishing a a path to partial conditional sanctions relief. Um, we cite the cases that I mentioned about Iran and Libya. Uh, and there are, of course, risks here, um, uh, both political and otherwise. Some allies might oppose providing Russia any positive inducements. Um, and it's going to be a whole lot harder to reassemble the sanctions coalition um, uh, in the future. However, um, this has been. Uh, you know, with the snapback clauses in the JCPOA, there have been creative mechanisms found to uh, to address this problem too. Um, so, uh, you know, we didn't argue in the paper, nor do we think, I, nor would I argue now, that the, that the U.S. should dramatically change its policy overnight. Um, but uh, it, we make the case that it's important to sort of think through these instruments now um, and socialize them uh, because given the U.S. interest in avoiding a long war, um, we're, that's the alternative we're facing unless we try to move, uh, to begin the process of moving in that direction uh, now. So um, in addition to that, I've been thinking through sort of more practical and maybe less um, rigorously thought through uh, uh, ideas about how to begin moving in this direction given uh, where we are today, which is um, uh, a situation that um, neither side, uh, neither of the sides, neither Russia, Ukraine, nor the West believe that the other is seriously interested in negotiations. Uh, and they all believe that the other sides would just use any uh, respite in the fighting for um, refitting and, uh, and opportunistically resuming the war. Um, so there are no efforts at negotiations, and everyone seems resigned to the inevitability of this conflict going on for uh, a long while. Um, and uh, they all seem to think that the other has maximalist goals um, uh, and uh, will not compromise on those. Um, so, and nobody's talking, really. Um, the Ukrainians and the Russians have very narrow channels on things like POWs, and they did have one on uh, the grain deal when it was working. Um, they, you know, so they're, they're sort of a working level mill-mill, uh, um, but nothing at the political level since uh, June of 2022. So um, we're at a logjam, even if you believe that um, none of this can go anywhere anytime soon, um, we need to, recognizing that negotiations when they begin could take a very long time. The Korean armistice negotiations took two years and over 547 meetings. 
um, and uh, and a lot of something like 40% of U.S. casualties in the war were incurred during the period of negotiation. So um, starting does not mean that uh, the war stops, right? We should think about the talking and fighting at the same time. So how do we get from here to there? Some uh, thoughts on that question. Um, so one thing that is striking is that these issues about the end game, uh, and, like where this might end up in any detail, um, and about uh, the um, tactics for talking and fighting at the same time, like how to manage that, are just not on the agenda with between the United States and Ukraine or between Ukraine and its other Western partners. So we need to begin having this conversation um, at the you know, government to government level uh, with um, the Ukrainian government. Um, that doesn't mean changing any other element of the current policy. It just means introducing another uh, piece of the dialogue, which as far as I understand is not there now. Um, now, I've seen how this works, that if, um, you know, particularly Western governments were to raise these issues, it would make clear that they value them, right? Uh, and that the Ukrainians would probably, it would probably spur an internal process of trying to think through those issues on their end. So this is sort of a, you know, we need to begin the process of talking or else we're never going to get there. Um, there's a similar dynamic that's going on within NATO, believe it or not, among allies. Um, of course, there are those allies that, uh, that need, need convincing that negotiations make sense eventually. Um, others need no convincing, but they are, uh, there's a firm belief that there's a taboo on, on talking about this issue. So there needs to be a socialization effort, and we hint at this here, um, uh, among allies to make both the issue of communication um, with the adversary and the nature of the war's endgame permissible subjects um, for official discussions. Um, so this could begin at the level of the Quad, which has been sort of reanimated, um, and that's not the Asian Quad, this is the US-European one, um, uh, that is the US, UK, Germany, France, uh, and then uh, per perhaps brought out to a more broad um, group of, uh, of uh, allies and partners. Um, but, but, you know, I think there, uh, the, there needs to be sort of permission granted to have these conversations by, uh, you know, I would argue the U.S. taking the initiative um, without, again, changing the elements of uh, current elements of the policy. In terms of, uh, so I've talked about the Ukrainians and, and allies. Um, there is, of course, another uh, entity involved in this, and that's Russia, um, uh, with which, uh, as far as I understand, there are no active channels at the moment on this issue. Um, and it would be hard to establish them. Uh, I think the, that what we can think about right now is um, steps that can be taken that would signal uh, a interest in eventual negotiations, um, steps that do not have to be negotiated in themselves. So for example, um, the US or the, and or the EU could appoint a special representative for conflict diplomacy. Um, now that person would likely spend the first six months talking among allies and with the Ukrainians, um, but it would be a signal that we're open to that eventuality. Um, and uh, that's just one sort of concrete idea. But thinking through steps that can be taken and also steps that, you know, uh, could be the Russians could take, such as not embarking on a uh, winter campaign to attack Ukrainian critical infrastructure that would uh, signal limited aims and a willingness to come to the table. Um, so I think, you know, we're at the point where like baby steps are, the, are, the, are, are going to be necessary to start this process moving in that direction. Um, and uh, um, uh, those are the ones that I would uh, think about taking at the moment. Um, so I'm happy to get into in the Q&A, you know, assessments of where the conflict is at this stage or other aspects of this. And, and I'd be very interested in feedback on our work. Um, and with that, I will be quiet. Well, I think I'm going to start with our 
three Russian experts in the room and see what they have to say. So Carol Savitz and then uh, Elizabeth Wood and then Polina Belyakova. So who wants to take the first question? I'm curious whether you can disaggregate some of the negotiation issues. So could there be a roster that your special representative would have to talk about, obviously POWs they're already working on, but um, limiting what kinds of warfare um, could be limited or are there issues around, um, you know, non-Russia, Ukrainians won't hit certain targets in Russia or um, are there other ways that they could that, that, that it, it's not all or nothing negotiations, but your baby steps could have different areas of, um, you know, I think the grain thing seems to be a mess, but are there other issues that could be kind of used to get them uh, talking in some third country, Turkey or something? I don't know. So interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, should I respond? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, the grain thing is interesting. It did collapse, the grain deal itself, the Black Sea Grain Initiative. However, um, what we've seen emerging, and this is interesting in the sort of like uh, intra-war tacit negotiation, the likes of which, you know, Schelling writes about, um, uh, that uh, both sides start after the grain deal collapsed, began by attacking uh, civilian infrastructure, civilian infra shipping infrastructure in the Black Sea. Uh, it turns out that that had consequences, economic consequences for both sides. Um, and we've seen an emergent norm of non, uh, you know, for the most part, they're avoiding attacks on civilian shipping in the Black Sea, both sides. Uh, and that has allowed Ukraine to uh, create this corridor uh, in territorial, in their own territorial waters to uh, engage in um, shipping, granted without the same size ships as were allowed under the Black Sea Grain Initiative, but without any inspection and so on. Um, so uh, that is uh, one of those cases where it's kind of a threshold that has emerged uh, through you know, the power to mutually hurt. Um, uh, other issues. Um, so I do think now, particularly that Ukraine has an ability to um, uh, strike into Russia. Um, the 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 idea of a pause on deep strikes would be another one. I mean, I'm thinking about these in terms of both signaling and um, uh, the the willingness to communicate limited aims. Right. So. Um, if it is true that Russia doesn't want to destroy Ukraine and take it all over and et cetera, et cetera, then they could demonstrate that by not, you know, uh, creating a situation where, you know, Ukrainians will freeze in their homes this winter. Um, so uh, those are the, you know, uh, they're not exactly confidence building measures, but sort of mutual signaling and perhaps, you know, sort of norms that limit certain kinds of, um, uh, military activities in the context of an ongoing war. Carol? Sam, thanks um, so much for your talk. Um, I appreciate the way you teased out the costs and benefits of different steps along the way, but you wrote this almost two years ago. One. One? Okay, but you were looking back at 20... My understanding was you were looking back at 2022 early in the early stages of the war. I think things have changed dramatically since then. And so people like me have been looking at, well, how do you, how would, what are the incentives to get people to the table? I mean, just last week, excuse me, the week before the Russians enunciated, again, very maximalist um, demands on what would end the war for them. And I don't see any incentive for Zelensky and the Ukrainians at the moment to say, well, we'd accept this line versus this line. People are arguing some kind of seeding of territorial you know, the eastern, the eastern part of Ukraine to Russia, how much. I, I don't see any incentives on both sides, and I don't see either side preparing its populations for some kind of a compromise that could lead to any of these other options that you and then Elizabeth just talked about could make some progress along the way. I mean, right now I see them both very, very dug in. So I guess my question to you is, how do you get from here to there to get to where any of these things could be operationalized or any of these policies could be operationalized 
and what kinds of incentive structures could we, they create in order to get people at least to begin to talk? So um, I would tend to discount uh, maximalist um, conditions being put out there in the context when a negotiation hasn't started. Both sides have every incentive to not negotiate with themselves before the talks begin. So, you know, Ukraine is out there saying we must retake every inch of our sovereign territory and, and the Russians must leave before talks can begin. The, you know, the Russians come out and say the ridiculous things that they say. Um, and uh, so I wouldn't put too much stock in that because they're not actually talking. So why would they step back from that? I, I do. I would note that um, the Russians have consistently at the very highest levels in recent weeks and months uh, been saying that they're open to talks. And interestingly, according to the chief Ukrainian negotiator from uh, Istanbul, when they were still talking, um, he thinks that's true. Um, in other words, he thinks that the Russians want a ceasefire and uh, that uh, they would be happy to have a ceasefire. But, um, you know, Ukraine is in a disadvantageous position. I'm referring to David Arachamia, the uh, leader of the pro-presidential fraction in the parliament who was led their delegation in Istanbul and gave an extensive interview a couple of weeks ago. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that is of note. I don't know, obviously, you know, until uh, you, if it's a bluff, we won't know until someone calls it, right? Um, and uh, I think that the incentives are, you know, I've, we did talk about some incentives here. Um, and you could creatively link some of the things that are already ongoing to potential negotiations. Like, you know, the at the moment, as far as I understand it, the bilateral security commitments, which are really security assistance commitments that the U.S. is currently negotiating, are uh, not being thought of in the context of the end game. Um, unlike, as was the case at Camp David, right, where the security assistance commitments were made in the context of uh, peace negotiation. So you could think about it that way. That is an incentive. Um, I do think that um, there's uh, um, uh, the, the, the population and popular expectations problem is a real one for Ukraine. Um, because I think, uh, you know, public opinion matters a whole lot more in Ukraine than it does in Russia. Um, I think that uh, Zelensky has, uh, is a little bit boxed in in that regard, um, in that he's He's laid out, uh, he's created expectations that um, are going to be hard to walk back from. However, I would note that, um, you know, as late as June of 2022, he was saying he wanted to negotiate directly with Putin. Um, you know, through up until September of 2022, he was willing to put, uh, you know, uh, neutrality, non alignment on the table. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so things change, uh, and perhaps they could change in a different direction than they have, uh, obviously, uh, since then. Um, but uh, I don't think Putin faces the same problem. I think he could stop today and declare victory um, and uh, sell that at home just fine. And if you look at uh, the surveys that do exist in Russia, they suggest that, you know, a, uh, a good plurality of the population would be just, you know, happy with uh, ending it. Provinces that they've well, they don't, they don't control fully. I know, but th anything. that's why I'm saying so. You, and they're talking about having elections in those areas when Putin runs for re-election in quotation marks in March. So I don't see why Ukraine would even agree to that kind of a compromise. Okay, so when we get to the question of territorial control and how that could be managed or thought of an eventual uh, uh, negotiated end, it seems unlikely to me that either side is going to be giving up significant uh, areas that they currently control. Um, I think that's a fair hypothesis, um, but that does not mean legally ceding your claims to, um, you know, in, in Ukraine's case, it's uh, internationally recognized uh, borders. So, um, you know, the, the Korea precedent here, the, the Republic of Korea uh, claims the entire peninsula as its own, you know, the Federal Republic of Germany claimed the entirety of Germany as its own. Um, the uh, and you know as a sort of model for Ukraine to think about as successfully reintegrated, of course, um, on its own terms. Uh, um, point I'm making is that 
thinking about partition or actually ceding territory in a de jure way is, I think, a non-starter, and it should be. Um, but that does not mean that you can, can't have a ceasefire or even a ceasefire that lasts. Territorial disputes um, can persist even when the combatants are not fighting, right? I mean, there, there's a territorial dispute, and we I could go on, Cyprus, et cetera, um, without uh, Moldova, um, without uh, uh, active bloodshed. Uh, I think this discussion leads to you, Polino. You know the Ukrainian um, thinking better than anybody here, I think. So what do you want to have to say here? Yeah, Roger, as a chance of disappointing you, my questions are actually about U.S. and Russia. And not I know, Ukraine. but I want to get you first on this other <laughs> question. And then you can ask me a question, right? Did you buy Sam's portrayal of Ukraine or not? And then you get your question. I do agree that Ukrainian foreign policy is more driven by public opinion than Russian foreign policy, regardless of this war. Historically, public opinion does not drive Russian foreign policy at all. Ukraine being a democratic state, state of course, is more driven by public opinion. Uh, there are fluctuations in Ukrainian public opinion currently regarding the support for war and the price that Ukrainian. Ukrainians are willing to continue to pay and there is a considerable variation between Ukrainians abroad and Ukrainians in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this winter will change how the score is land because Russia already started attacks on uh, Ukrainian critical infrastructure. Uh, this night cave was attacked uh, and it will continue every night. So we should pay closer attention to what people in Ukraine think than what people in Russia think about the continuation of that war. That's right. where I rest my case. So, um, yes, and you want I to agree 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's, uh, that's too bad. I'm trying to get this. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe your next question will fulfill this So, uh, as I was listening to you, I, I felt like some key components are missing from the presentation, so I would appreciate if you could help us fill this in. First, the formulation of U.S. foreign policy interests not formulated based on Ukraine. But in general, where do you assume the United States wants to see itself vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Europe in general? Mm -hmm. Because I don't believe the suffering of Ukrainian civilians, and I say it as a Ukrainian civilian, should rank anywhere even in the top 10 of U.S. foreign policy priorities. I think when we think about U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine, we should see a bigger picture of where U.S. wants to see itself vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Russia. And then keeping those answers in mind, I'm not entirely satisfied with binary modeling of either continuation of hostilities or negotiations. I would like to ask a question, what, because negotiations and the battlefield performance are inherently linked. So the question, what has to happen in the battlefield so that the negotiated agreement best matches U.S. foreign policy interests vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Russia, including Russia post-negotiation, emboldened Russia, that does not have to fight Ukraine. So three components, U.S. foreign policy interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Europe, what has to happen in the battlefield in Ukraine so the negotiated deal best matches those foreign policy interests, and what are the risks and threats Russia, post-negotiation Russia, can pose to those U.S. interests? Just to, to put your report in a larger context, because I'm not sure that it's entirely fair to model U.S. foreign policy interests in terms of the suffering of Ukrainian civilians as much as I sympathize with Ukrainians. Well, I mean, you could say that the... <laughs> it's funny that I'm arguing for the, the that being factored into U.S. foreign policy with uh, uh, someone from Ukraine. But um, so to be, to be clear, we didn't start with the abstract question of what are U.S. interests and what should the policy be. We, we did it thinking about like the how the war could evolve and what the key factors in that evolution are and how those evolutions would affect uh, U.S. Those factors, you know, of the way the conflict evolves could affect U.S. interests. So if we had started from a different premise, so just to, you know, defend the approach we took, I think that it's just a different kind of approach than the one you're advocating. I mean, you know, U.S. foreign policy priorities in the context of the war are obviously uh, go beyond, um, you know, the stuff that, well, are, are 
it's a different question in itself. And you know, I should preface this by saying like the Biden administration's foreign policy priorities, because like who knows what where where we could be um, in uh, in a year. But I can tell you, I think about how they think about this in terms of. Um, or you could, if you're asking for my opinion, I could also give that. But uh, w which of the two are you thinking about? I'm asking you to fill in these key variables because when I'm trying to model some scenarios, mm. I cannot really foresee the outcomes unless I know this. For example, what is the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis Russia's influence in Europe? Imagine Russia's right. house fighting in Ukraine. How emboldened Russia in Europe affects U.S. foreign policy right. interests, given that exactly. Russia is not committed anymore to fighting in Ukraine, and the U.S. presumably does not, too. So you argue that it will expand the U.S. bandwidth to deal with other important foreign policy issues. But another important foreign policy issue that U.S. has to commit its foreign policy resources now is emboldened Russia in the middle of Europe. Well, you're making right. an so, assumption about <laughs> Russia post-war, right? Um, and uh, I, I students and scholars of Russian foreign policy. Yes. And we know that there are some persistent drivers of Russian foreign policy, and it's safe to assume that Russia would pursue uh, more influence in Europe. And it's okay to say, you know what, U.S. has to get out of That's Europe. That's not what I'm it, arguing. It's not in our interest at all, and then model it from there. No, no. But we have to have some answers, for example, about what the preferred position of Russia in Europe for U.S. foreign policy interests. Otherwise, we cannot model this scenario. You can give your opinion if it's. But you're easy. implying that you know what Russia does afterward, and you know what the effect is on Europe, and you know what America's interests are in Europe. You don't know any of those things. But we have to model a repertoire of possibilities, otherwise, we don't have the values of the variables we're operating so with. I think, though, uh, so I would, uh, I, I, you know, the US, regardless, is going to have to, first of all, all parties are going to treat any ceasefire as an operational pause because they will assume that the other side is. The question about uh, the durability of a ceasefire um, uh, is, I don't assume, though, that <coughs> therefore there's no chance of having a ceasefire that, do that does not lead to an emboldenment of Russia. I mean, I think this has been a strategic catastrophe for Russia. I think that's true regardless of where the line is. I don't know that it is less of a strategic catastrophe for Russia um, today than it was a year ago, um, and uh, arguably more, given the uh, you know number of casualties and etc. Um, so um, my the the interest in the context of a post ceasefire is avoiding war recurrence um, in Ukraine. This war has been, you know, uh, a hugely negatively consequential. There have been some, you know, positive side benefits, but the negatives far outweigh the positives, in my view. Uh, and you know, we would want to avoid a repeat of that, no question. Um, and that I think needs to be actually the way we're, we're thinking about the end game is to fr to create the conditions so that this does not happen again, um, or minimize the chances that it would. Sure, but I didn't answer the first two. Either. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it, I realized that I'm asking big questions here. So, uh, given the let's model that U.S. foreign policy preference is to terminate the war in Ukraine and prevent the occurrence of uh, another episode of conflict in Ukraine, if we have operational ceasefire, should the United States also treat it as an opportunity to rearm and retrain Ukraine? That's to prevent the next episode, to deter Russia from attacking. Yes. Then welcome to security dilemma. Well, of course. But that's going to have to be a picture of it. I mean, I think a piece of it, that, this, that there's, you know, for example. So how do you do that? Like, uh, what model of a future Ukrainian, you know, military do you think you try to enable? Are you enabling combined arms offensive warfare? Or are you enabling strategic defense? I mean, there are different models for how the U.S. could pursue security assistance in the context of a of a ceasefire. Yeah, I'm just curious whether it will actually free some bandwidth for U.S. foreign policy dealing with other stuff, or overload U.S. foreign policy with just different brand of the same thing. Given that I also prefer no fighting in Ukraine. Or different yeah. brand of the same thing, but I'd like to. So well, let's continue this conversation. The, the, yeah. No, but this is a good question in the sense that um, uh, uh, I, I think we should 
stipulate that there's going to be a much more robust U.S. security relationship with Ukraine after the war, no matter what. The question is how robust, right? Not whether there will be one or not. I think that that uh, ship has sailed, um, so to speak, in a good way. You know, um, well, I think it's an empirical reality, regardless. Um, and uh, I think that the the um, the 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 so it can be framed around uh, in different ways. Of course, there's going to be a security dilemma dynamic. Of course, both sides are going to uh, rearm on the assumption that the other is going to uh, undertake offensive action in the future. But there, that also happened in other conflicts. Are you saying that it can feel irrespective of the outcome of next fall's election? Okay, I guess. Uh, like, I, I, I think we're to account for uh, the, the a 180 in US foreign policy in my uh, analysis, so I mean, like, yes, if there is a 180 in U.S. foreign policy and everything is turned on its head, like, you know, all of this is, you know, pointless, right? So, I mean, I have to kind of assume a degree. <laughs> okay, barring significant discontinuity. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that caveat. It's a, it's a fair point, and I was thinking it myself as I was saying it, but um, uh, I do think that there's a, um, there are broader points about increasing the costs uh, associated with, you know, um, well, ensuring that Russia pays a price that serves as a deterrent in itself, both to Russia in the future and to other potential aggressors, right? Um, and uh, but I think we've actually ticked that box. I would argue. Um, and uh, uh, there are other interests in terms of alliance unity and so on, particularly for this administration, the way they see it. Um, so I do think that there are broader foreign policy issues at stake here. Um, I do not see there being a binary model of negotiations versus fighting. There, as we saw in 2022, uh, the negotiations when they were ongoing and most intensive occurred when there was fierce fight. Um, and I would expect that to be the case here. As I mentioned in Korea, you know, the U.S. incurred 45% of its total casualties during the two-year period of negotiations. So, um, but that said, a negotiated end is a binary to continued fight. Um, because uh, there's not much of a history of interstate wars ending without negotiations. Uh, and so either you have that end or you have continued fighting, right? Um, and that, I think, is the point we we're trying to make. I guess some people still want to jump in on this. You are a game modeler, yes. Yeah, uh, so obviously I'm not as familiar with the politics as everybody else here. But jumping off your point of ensuring that Russia knows it's going to take an appropriate cost should it choose to resume fighting. My general view on the whole situation was that most people were predicting that Russia would not have a particularly good time in Ukraine at the start of this conflict. At least that, from the sources I was seeing, I mean, the degree to which, you know, they got the several kilometer long convoy just stuck on a road on the way to Kiev was unexpected. But I don't, I thought that there was always going to be a relatively significant amount of kickback. And so I guess the, the, the core of my question is, how do you structure the the mechanism for punishing Russia should it choose to re-engage in hostilities such that its calculus would be different than it was before it began the current invasion. Because, yeah. you know, if, if the current invasion looked like a terrible idea to start, then, well, even if you make it look like a terrible idea to resume, they might just take that option anyway. I mean, that's the sort of the... <laughs> well, uh, so there's, they, they might just take that option anyway is always, you know, you could say that regardless. But... I disagree fundamentally with your characterization of their calculus at the beginning of the conflict. They thought this would be a cakewalk. Um, and they planned for, you know, like the capital to fall within a week. That's why they only had, you know, a week t a tail of logistics behind them. So uh, they thought the Ukrainians would, you know, the military would surrender. Um, they were not preparing for this to be uh, what it turned out to be, quite clearly. Uh, this was going to be the thunder run to Baghdad. Uh, part two, yeah. Russian style. Um, yeah, I, and I, I guess my, I, I, I realize that I said, I, I, I guess what I more mean is that not as, is that how do you stop Russia from 
misevaluating? Well, so I think that here they have a fair amount of information uh, about uh, that this hurts. Uh, and that even uh, and that the Ukrainian military can impose costs on on them when they try to take even now small offensives come at tremendous cost to the Russian military. So you know, with uh, uh, consistent um, and long term you know assistance from its partners, Ukraine I think can have something of a deterrent going forward, and that Russia knows it now in a way that they didn't before. Uh, I think the most we can think about is what, creating incentives and disincentives. Ultimately, he's he's going to do what he's going to do, right? Um, but shaping those choices is the best that that, that third party is going to come. Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit. I'm going to ask, ask Chap uh, and then Barry because I know you two have I think different views. On Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I ask my question in a much more collegial way than I was probably going to ask it, so that's that's a good thing. But I, I guess my, my first comment, which you can respond to or not, is, is I think it would be the height of your responsibility, and fanciful thinking, to imagine that Russia, if it achieves most of its territorial, stated territorial objectives in Ukraine, would not emerge from this incredibly emboldened with respect to its policies in Europe. Yes. That I, th I think any, any other starting point would be kind of a magical thinking exercise and not really worth undertaking. Um, that's that's the comment. Um, the, the question is... It's sort of a thought terminating statement. Well, I mean, I... I it is know, a comment, but it's, it's a comment that you can real. respond, but I just think there's, there's, there's no look at the empirical realities over the last 15 years. And, Russia, when you have a former KGB agent you who know, uh, wants to recreate the Soviet Union, has stated so in a way that she makes it not cheap talk, who by the whales one the richest men in the world, said like if they were going to have peace in Europe after a ceasefire in Ukraine with the least competition. That just seems uh, so implausible mm -hmm. um, that it would, it would be a very uh, shaky foundation on which to construct the rest of your theoretical apparatus. I guess that's my first first thought. Um, other thought is even, I guess, more depressing, but, uh, you know, better than a coin toss that Trump wins the election at this point. And I think uh, pretty clearly stated by the people he will appoint that, that the United States will withdraw from NATO in some form or fashion. You know, the treaty may not be abrogated, but we will send a very clear signal that we're not willing to defend um, the eastern border of Europe. Uh, so how will that affect your <laughs> Oh, boy. Um, so uh, uh, Russia has not achieved its territorial goals. It did not achieve its initial territorial goals. It hasn't achieved even its revised uh, down territorial goals. It says uh, Kherson region is part of Russia. It does not control Kherson city. It says Zaporizhia is part of Russia. It does not control Zaporizhia city. So, um, you know, the idea that uh, if there were to be a ceasefire along the line of contact today, um, that uh, Russia had achieved its territorial goals, I sort of, did, you know, uh, I would argue with the premise of the question. Um, so, you know, like the uh, initial objective of the operation failed spectacularly. Uh, they haven't even achieved the, like, you know, sort of uh, sized down version of, of that, of what they've stated their objectives. And they've kept it so opaque as to what exactly they mean by the borders of these quote unquote new regions that uh, leaving themselves a lot of room for um, uh, ambiguity on that subject, but also um, potential, you know, uh, uh, claims that they need not necessarily realize on the ground. So I just think that, that it, we're, you're talking about a Russia that I don't recognize in terms of its current state and what it has been able to achieve within Ukraine. The second bit about peace in Europe. So are, we're, you're clearly referencing the possibility of a NATO Russia, of a Russian attack on a NATO ally, right? Um, that goes beyond Ukraine, right? So I mean, I would say that there's... Beyond that, Slovakia and Moldova are client states. Slovakia? 
the Black Sea. You know, look at the elections that Russia then influences and it becomes a effectively aligned with Russia. The Black Sea becomes a Russian lake. The Caucasus region becomes, you know, the Black Sea is a NATO lake right now. Just yeah. right now, yeah. right now yeah. it is a NATO lake. Yeah, right, right. now it is. It's just, these are the facts that we created. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I guess um, I'm. Uh, I think that we have a lot. If we're looking for empirical evidence that we've gained from this conflict, it's that um, uh, U.S. slash NATO deterrence of Russia is a whole lot better than we thought it was. Um, that Russia is deterred from attacking uh, the U.S. and its allies, even when they are doing things that nobody could have thought in the realm of the possible before this war, um, such as like supplying Ukraine with long range uh, precision strike. So um, I actually think that uh, we've, we, you know, we have, we, we have a lot of good data, so to speak, about um, the effectiveness of US deterrence in Europe. Uh, and I don't see that diminishing uh, if there is a ceasefire. So I do think that non-allies of the United States are, um, you know, in a different position fundamentally, but uh, I actually, you know, I'm, I, I think we have more evidence more reason to be reassured about the effectiveness of the of uh, the Article Five as a deterrent to potential Russian aggression against NATO allies, and of course, in the short term, Russia will be in a much worse military position to uh, to to affect any of those um, any of any further territorial goals against other countries as a result of the losses that's incurred. Um, the second question was about uh, you know our domestic politics which I will stay away from, only to say that I just can't answer that question again uh, because I don't, um, you know, I can't, I can't, like, it's I'm beyond the realm. My brain, I get a syntax error, you know, so. Um. Very posing. So, I don't want to get into the preceding uh, debate. I, I want to ask you about something I did not see in your talk, and I, I wondered if, Given the trends, maybe it should figure a bit more prominently. And that's the risk of, of Russian successes in the other direction. That means that, that Ukraine will find itself over the next year facing an ever more difficult military situation, something that is somewhat akin to the situation that the Russians put themselves in artificially at the end of the summer of 22 when they had failed to deal with their personnel losses. So the kinds of attacks that happened with Kherson and Kharkov... Could you Kherson speak up a little bit because yeah. we can't hear in the back? The kind of attacks that the Ukrainians were able to mount against Kharkov and Kherson because the Russians did not replenish their personnel losses they are now likely to fall on the Ukrainians. There's, it may be a tail risk, but there's a tail risk of, a, of, a, of an unusually successful Russian attack somewhere along the front. I think what we can see on the basis of the trends of the war is that Ukraine just has this fundamental problem that Russia has four times the people. Mm -hmm. In an attrition war, if you can find four times the people, the Ukrainians have to kill four times as many Russians. And they just aren't successful. They've been very successful on the battlefield, but just not that successful. Right? So there is this risk. And I wonder, do you sense in among people you talk to that there's a simple discounting of this risk, or that such a risk is starting to be accounted for? Do you think that the risk is, that you yourself think the risk is there? Do you think the Ukrainians or we have an answer to this essential problem of being badly outnumbered in the attrition war, regardless of guns and ammunition that we provide the Ukrainians. There, there is this problem that's sticking its head above the ocean here. And it seems to me like it, you know, it, it too should figure into an assessment of the wisdom of trying to get some sort of a negotiation going. I uh, agree that the, that there is a tail risk, um, but um, it, it is. I think it's fair to say that defense has been dominant in this war, uh, yeah. and that um, uh, Russian offensives have been 
even when they have succeeded, have come at such tremendous cost uh, as to affect their ability to do further offenses. Um, this happened at Vugudar in January, February of this year. It's happening, you know, right now in Avdivka. They might eventually take that uh, uh, city, but it's, um, you know, it will have come at really uh, tremendous cost. So um, that, I think, uh, suggests that the risk is, um, you know, uh, manageable, uh, or it could be managed. Um, I, I think at the moment, the risk is being publicly uh, the opposite of discounted, so as to scare Congress into <laughs> approving the supplemental. Uh, the, you know that the, you know the the administration saying, uh, if we don't pass this, then you know the U.S. and Russia will be at war in, in Europe because Putin will be marching on Warsaw. Um, you know, which I think maybe is a bit of political theater to 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 achieve a particular outcome, but. Um, uh, I, I think that there's, in the ab, you can't really compare populations in the abstract. You have to compare the size of the militaries that are actually fighting, right? And there, it's not as um, lopsided as, uh, you know, the, the overall population numbers because Russia hasn't mobilized as many, um, as, as many forces as Ukraine has, right? Um, and uh, they could, but I think as we saw when they did last, uh, uh, it was fall of 22, um, there are political consequences for that. Um, and, uh, you know, Russia is not a democracy, but the, the public opinion, they, they, the leadership takes public opinion quite seriously. Uh, and there was a spike in sort of a public anxiety after that um, uh, partial mobilization. And they, since then, at least you can tell by the extent to which they've taken measures to avoid having to do it again, that is by paying extreme amounts for people to uh, sign, you know, to basically to enlist, um, so as to avoid having to do a second round. So it's the, you know, the abstract numbers are, as you say, lopsided, but it's not, uh, you know, you have to look at who's, you know, the, the, the numbers actually on the line. And um, there it's not quite as lopsided. So um, I, I do think my personal view is that this is, you know, that we should, consider this as a possible risk. And particularly if the bottom were to fall out on Western assistance, that would make it a more significant risk. Um, and I would also argue here, I can say something about the 180 uh, in US foreign policy factor, where it should factor into our, uh, the calculus about the desirability of a settlement, or not a settlement, a ceasefire um, before, uh, in 2024, is that if in fact, um, not only is there this tail risk of uh, Russian offensive success, but there's also a risk that, you know, Ukraine will be um, uh, completely left to its own devices by the United States under a new president, then you presumably would want to lock in the gains that you've made so as to avoid losing them in the future. Um, but that is not the logic that's currently governing the U.S. approach yeah, to I it. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. That would be my other question. If we have pipeline issues, there seems to be a lot of adjectives in between. Um, so, uh, you know, the, there are no, the, the people uh, in charge in, in, in D.C. Are, not, are no fools. Um, and if you look at the language that they use, it's quite careful um, about how they construe the end game. Um, they have always said from the beginning that they see this ending in negotiations. People seem to forget that, but it's always it's repeated. Um, and they have conceived of military advances as providing Ukraine a better negotiating position as opposed to a means of achieving an absolute military victory. Um, and uh, so there might be some, uh, uh, you know, you hear different things from Congress, as we were just talking about earlier. Um, but uh, uh, I think that there's a degree, I mean, there might have been some fanciful thinking about, about the ability to um, retake large swaths of the South, but it was an untested proposition. So, you know, uh, what fanciful thinking are you referring to in particular? Well, at least in the public rhetoric does suggest that. But again, maybe we should think about that as the kind of maximalist rhetoric you would see in the absence of negotiations before they actually sit down. Um, and also the popular pu public opinion problems that, that Zelensky faces. So, Ken Oye, you want to jump in on this? Um, 
I'm actually just going to stand so because the pillar's in the way, like Fenway Park. <laughs> <laughs> the 180 that you referred to is actually something that is not in the distant future because expectations on that 180 would be conditioning bargaining behavior of mm -hmm. the Russians and Ukrainians today. I want to cite evidence on this point. It's odd evidence. I was in London going to a play, Patriots, nice oligarch, and there were two Russians seated next to me. One of them stepped on my foot, leaving the theater, which led to the conversation. They were very well versed <laughs> on foreign affairs. They would not tell me where they were. But the part that was striking, after going through a lot of the history on Ukraine, what was going on, we turned to the topic of the end game. And I was told in explicit terms, you fool, don't you understand that when Donald Trump is elected, assistance will be cut off, and that will be the end game. And then she went into a long discussion of how that should affect the negotiating behavior of Russia and Ukraine today. In fact, she was talking about how the reluctance of Russia to make concessions now was rooted in the expectations that the Senate and the presidency would revert to the hands right. of Trump. Um, the other parts of the discussion were on principal agent problems. Quote, we own that bastard. Her friend disagreed and said we share ownership for the Saudis. But <laughs> <laughs> is that it's not unrealistic in thinking about 180. Mm -hmm. If that 180 were to take place or has expectations on that change, it affects negotiating behavior now. And it may affect it as much as the comments on the military situation on the ground. Yeah. I'm not talking about my foot, which is okay. over the <laughs> <laughs> Um so, uh, I did not say that the, I mean, I would agree that expectations about the 180 are, or potential 180 are uh, likely to factor into all sides calculus going forward. I think there's no question about that. Um, I just, I can't, it's hard as a, from an analytical perspective to incorporate a 180 into your future outlook um, in terms of like thinking through uh, some of the like U.S. interests, right? Okay, that's sort of an abstract term, uh, abstract concept in 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 the context of the potential 180. But um, uh, so here's what I would say about the way in which um, it is certainly it, it, it's plausible, and it sounds like uh, it, it would be true that uh, it expectations about uh, the outcome of our elections are affecting Russian readiness or not to engage in negotiation. Right now, I would note that, um, you know, that is an untested proposition. And as a matter of policy, um, you know, it, even if you think that they are going to wait until the election to, you know, engage. No, no. They're not waiting, but their behavior now is conditioned by expectations on that. So I'm not sure that about whether the assumptions about Trump are shared, that you heard, are shared uh, universally in Moscow. Um, uh, I think, yeah, there are different views on that question. Um, but my point is more just that uh, even if it does, even if, so the only way you can actually empirically test that is by having a table and having people sit at it and having them articulate what their conditions are. So, and their willingness, and demonstrate their willingness to compromise or not. We don't have that table. So it, it's sort of an abstract conversation about incentives, uh, kind of, you know, with, without the, uh, we can speculate endlessly about, you know, whether Putin would do this or that, and there's, you know, reasons to think he would do this or not that. But in this case, you know, we, we can test the, the proposition. Um, it's just not happening. We got time for about two more questions, so sir, you go, and then I will maybe end with Jim, especially if it's a nuclear question, because I like to touch on that. All right, well, I won't go near nuclear, but thank you. And I want to potentially disagree, and I just say potentially, okay. with the idea that we have defense counsel. We certainly have it today, but 
That is for two reasons. One is the Ukraine is much more thoroughly mobilized than Russia. And Russia does not enjoy a three or four to one superiority in numbers in the fair. Right. But they could. And the other is the Russian Air Force has been minimally present in this war. And that's because they either don't want to pay the price of penetrating Ukrainian air defenses or because for some technical reasons they can't do it. If that were to change, if the, both of these were to change, I'm not speculating about the likelihood of them changing, then they could mount the drive from Kharkov to Terracon and cut off the bulk of the Ukrainian forces. And it could be done within a month, and it would transform the war. But of course, this requires two slightly improbable things to happen. What do you think of that? So the two slightly improbable things are achieving air superiority and, uh, and mobilizing the same percentage of their population as Ukraine. It's a very good question. Uh, I mean, you know, I hesitate to predict how the future in this context. Um, I, let me put it this way. I think we've seen hesitancy to pay the political costs of repeating the mobilization that, that Russia um, uh, uh, undertook in uh, fall of 22. Um, and efforts, extreme efforts made to avoid having to do so. So that suggests that they're not eager to do it. Um, now, I should have noted that like, you know, we're seeing signs that Ukraine is um, trying to uh, either, you know, sort of more effectively mobilize than they have before changing the standards for who qualifies. You know, there are these sort of um, viral videos of raids on like, uh, you know, fitness centers where they, they, uh, they issue um, draft notices to, uh, to young men uh, in recent uh, days. Um, and so the political consequences of, of a further mobilization in Ukraine are also probably a limiting factor. Um, uh, air defense. Um, so here, I think actually, you know, the Western assistance thing is probably the dominant um, determinant, right? So Ukraine has largely, from what I understand, run out of um, uh, munitions, or maybe not run out of, run out of the munitions maybe they had. I think they probably have uh, acquired some from abroad for the Soviet-built air defense that they had, which was quite extensive. Um, and uh, they have received a number of Western uh, air defense systems and a fair amount of you know, ammunition to supply them, and they've used them to a significant effect. So keeping the munitions for the air defenses going is going to be the key, I think, determinant of that. But there was a lot of worry about this issue last year, or maybe it was early this year, um, that is about Russia eventually establishing air superiority because the Ukrainians would run out of slits as far as air defense is concerned, and that has not happened. So we will see going forward, Russia is building a factory to produce these uh, you know, Iranian model uh, suicide drones, so they might, um, you know, have them in such large numbers that the Ukrainians are forced to expend, you know, more air defense munitions that they have. But again, now we're getting into speculation about how the war. Well, no, but they would have to presumably use um, less valuable uh, assets to exhaust the inventory of air defense missiles, right? And then, and then, yeah, oh, yeah, then there could be trouble, right? But uh, um, well, we're, we're, I, I want to just. I think part of this has to do with how Russia sees the stakes. If they see, if you're John Mearsheimer in Russia, this is an ex existential battle for them, then they're likely to expend more airplanes or remobilize, I think. But getting to this point also touches on whether they'd use nuclear weapons if this is an existential conflict. Jim, do you have, or you maybe have a different question? So first, thank you for your talk. And it's an important topic and people need to be working on it. Uh, I. I and about your talk, you know, you raise the issue of duration and e escalation. And my point is a minor one. But it seems to me that duration would add to the possibilities of escalation in, in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. One is the passage of time 
as a neutral thing that has no characteristics. You know, it's five years, it's six years. With the, if something, anything that has a probability over zero, the longer the time horizon is extended, the greater the chance the thing will happen, right? That's one form of duration leads to escalation because it creates a bigger space for random events. Mm. The second one is that its duration affects the quality of the players, and it's not neutral. And here I'm wondering about a possibility where, you know, I presume uh, that we talk about that escalation with Russia being something around Crimea or maybe encirclement of troops, some really big thing where they feel like they have to threaten the use of a tactical or other nuclear weapon. But it seems to me that the, as the thing goes on, another scenario is that the chief motivation for the Ukrainians will be to take the war to Russia. And that they're going to want deep strike. And five years from now, you know, they're starting at zero. Russia's not starting at zero for five, at, at deep strike. They're starting at zero. So maybe five years from now, they have something of their own jury rig, whatever. But that one possibility would be a desperate Ukraine has a strike that we wouldn't consider strategic. It doesn't kill enough people. But for Moscow, it is somehow seen as so dramatic and uh, psychologically significant that they would feel compelled to respond. So I said that only as an example of deep strike growing capability if that were to happen. I don't know that that's going to happen. I know nothing about it. But the, the passage of time and escalation happens neutrally, and it happens because of changes in the capability of the players over time. On the first point, when you say neutrally, the bigger space for random events, that's a sort of mathematic probabilistic argument, um, or is it about the possibility of unintended escalation? Well, I think if it's unintended, then we don't see it coming, and it sort of enters into a random category. I'm saying the longer there's time for mischief, the greater the chance that the dice roll comes up badly for you. That there are things that we, we didn't anticipate the conflict, we haven't anticipated half the things that have happened in the conflict. I assume we will continue to be surprised in the conflict, and I bet the rate of surprise increases as the duration increases. As people become more motivated and extreme and desperate in their behavior. So, I mean, I've struggled with this question. So, Because empirically, I can see how the risk of uh, vertical escalation has varied over time, and it's lower now than it was a year ago today, right? So what does that tell us about a sort of linear progression of risk? Um, it would seem that that's the opposite, right? If, if they're more acute. So it really depends on battlefield conditions as opposed to conflict duration. Well, with the exception of the potential for inadvertent escalation, or let me put it this way, um, uh, sort of uh, escalation caused not by a deliberate act of aggression, right? So because events like the cruise missile ending up in the middle of Poland or the Ukrainian air defense missile ending up in not the middle of Poland, but the you know what, east of Poland. Um, the, the, there are uh, things like that could happen more often, right? And that, but I, I'm, I, would, I'm, I struggle with the idea about risk linearly increasing over time just because of time. Well, um, But what if the risk goes down? Right. But I think that we can say that for sure, right? That that it's higher now than it was before the war, the risk, um, and that it will remain elevated so long as the war goes on. Um, but how elevated, I think, would depend on battlefield conditions more than anything else. Um, Okay, but I, the oh, the purchase we do have is the evidence from last year um, that if if the New York Times is to be believed. On a, any given day, yes, but we we know when it was highest, right? Um, so at least again, th there's some evidence to suggest that, right? So I mean, anyway, I I myself don't have good answers to this, but I've struggled with the same question about. Um, can you say uh, something about the risks of escalation and duration regardless of the, you know, independent of battlefield conditions? Um, but, uh, so I would note that actually the Ukrainians have done a lot of deep strikes already. Um, 
uh, not, obviously not to the same scale as Russia has and not um, uh, to the same effect. Um, uh, but it has, you know, they've, they've done it and that demonstrates that they could do more of it. Um, there is, uh, it, you know, in looking at how decision making on nuclear use would potentially proceed, it's hard to imagine how you get from a deep strike um, to, you know, tactical nuclear weapons use without there being some steps in between, right? So I could see escalatory dynamics being created by a deep strike, but, you know, I think there's got to be some more piece, steps on that ladder before you get to the, to the nuclear use question. Uh, we're over time. I want to, though, say just three minutes here quickly, because what a project I've been trying to run uh, here as acting director is what good are our theories about this war? We have theories. They should be able to help us understand Ukraine. So it's very interesting to hear people have been in the policy world and Rand come here. So we theorists, we like to think we're doing something which helps. And so what are the concepts which have, have really been helpful? Um, I mean, one of the main things is the Firon's rationalist war. And you actually, it's not that useful, actually, because... The idea about the rationalist war is we don't know who's stronger and who has the most will. And war has to reveal that information. Right. But it only goes so far in this case because there's one key piece, which is Western support is so important in this war. And it's not very, you can't figure that war doesn't reveal that very readily. So there's a limited kind of idea with, with Firon's idea about rationalist war. I think credible commitment issues, these are big in your, your study, how to overcome those, and that's what a lot of what you were doing was there. Um, one thing you mentioned, which I think is actually a very big problem, which are how to get to the earlier piece, and if you clarify that you're going to keep giving assistance to Ukraine, why don't they keep this fighting? Because we're going to clean up after their mess. And this is, you mentioned, as perverse incentives. I think most political scientists call this the moral hazard problem. And people want to stay away from that because, you know, it, it says, you know, don't give these, these guys are reckless drivers. Don't help them even though they're the victims in the case. And I think that's something you touched on, but I think probably um, could be touched on more. Uh, one other um, thing you didn't mention is we have a, a are, um, you mentioned um, uh, Cyprus at one point. I was just in Cyprus. Actually, I think Cyprus is a success case. It just took them, you know, decades to, nobody's going to kill each other there. Nobody cares anymore. Right. They got separated on different sides of the line. You can go across the line and people are living happily ever after, after a frozen conflict of 50 years. Why do we believe we need a negotiated settlement rather than a frozen conflict that's going to happen? where we don't actually negotiate an armistice like in Korea, but it just sits there for, for a long, long time. There was a ceasefire in Cyprus. Well, there was a ceasefire, but it, there was never really settled. A lot of the issues were never settled sure. in the way. So, um, but a lot of the reasoning here, it comes from not this frozen conflict literature, but with an analogy with Korea. And but that, isn't Korea a frozen conflict? Well, was it or not? I don't think it, in the same sense as Karabakh and all of these other places that, that got unfrozen very quickly, or Cyprus, or Transnistria. Uh, Korea was a war, part of the Cold War. How much does that analogy apply and how much it does? I don't know, but this seems to be a, a huge basis of, of um, this, uh, the, the argument um, that, that many people are making now. So, um, and then how much is this constructed versus how much this is just based? I, I, I read your, your article. And by the way, you also don't really think the, sta the Hernick stalemate concept is very useful. We talked about uh, before we met. So, um, uh, how much of this is actually constructed rather than just based on capabilities, which gets into the realist versus non-realist argument. And the fact that you talked at one time about making negotiation a permissible subject. 
this is really the logic of appropriateness versus the logic of consequences that we always talk about in social science. So any rate, looking as a political science professor, what are the things that you're using and find most useful and which are the ones you're sort of um, um, touching on and not, not expanding on and which are the ones you don't find useful was an interesting thing. And uh, maybe we'll pick up more in our own conversations at Security Studies Program on Ukraine and our, our theories. So with that, That'd be great. I'm going to stop and uh, wish her. <laughs>